They keep coming up with multiple theories about how the Great Pyramid was built, and none of them make any sense to me. This thing is just a gigantic mystery. You can take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply by 43,200, and you get the polar radius of the Earth. You can measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid, multiply it by the same number, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. That number is not a random number. Graham Hancock, Egyptians never built pyramids. In the ancient land of Egypt, our ancestors left behind remarkable marks in the form of colossal structures. The Great Pyramids and the majestic sphinxes stand as enduring symbols of their civilization. However, these old marbles have long puzzled researchers, veiling themselves in mysteries. Many theories formed over time have led to misconceptions about them. British writer Graham Hancock has extensively studied ancient Egyptian civilization and has written numerous books. Famous podcaster Joe Rogan recently organized a podcast with Graham Hancock to shed light on the hidden truths surrounding these ancient sphinxes. However, Graham Hancock made an unsettling announcement stating that the Egyptians never built pyramids and sphinxes. This is a bold statement that challenges our existing understanding of history. Let's delve into the origin and age of those grand structures and the terrifying revelation made by Graham Hancock. Egypt is a country with a rich history, and its people take great pride in it, connecting deeply with their ancient roots. Recently, Egypt reopened the Avenue of the Sphinxes in Luxor, a 1.7-mile-long path adorned with over 1,000 statues of sphinxes and rams. This avenue, buried under sand for many years, now connects Luxor with Karnak temples in the eastern part of Egypt. The reopened ceremony was a grand affair, tourism, and antiquities, and attended by President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. The event featured pharaonic customs, a symphony orchestra, and boats on the Nile. The Avenue of Sphinxes was discovered in 1949 during excavation near Luxor Temple by Egyptian archaeologists Zachariah Gonheim and Mohammed Abdel Qadia. The initial section of the avenue was unearthed between 1958 and 1960. However, the most famous sphinx in Egypt is the Great Sphinx of Giza. Joe Rogan, known for hosting guests with unconventional opinions, invited Professor Robert Schock to discuss the origin and age of the Great Sphinx on his show. The Egyptologist presented evidence suggesting that the Great Sphinx is much older than commonly believed, although this view is not universally accepted in scientific community. Old Egyptologists in the late 19th, early 20th century had actually suggested that just the way it looks, the feel of the Sphinx, not based on hard evidence, really, that maybe it was older than the pyramids. Sphinxes, creatures with the body of a lion and the head of a human, are well-known figures in Egyptian, Asian, and Greek mythology. In ancient Egypt, the Sphinx served as a spiritual guardian and was often depicted as a male wearing a pharaoh's headdress, similar to the Great Sphinx. Sphinx figures were commonly found in tomb and temple complexes. The Avenue of the Sphinxes, located in Upper Egypt, is a two-mile pathway lined with Sphinx statues that connect the Luxor and Karnak temples. There are also Sphinxes depicting the female pharaoh, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, such as the granite Sphinx statue at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the large alabaster Sphinx at the Ramesseum Temple in Memphis, Egypt. The concept of the Sphinx spread from Egypt to Asia and Greece around the 15th to 16th century BC. The Asian Sphinx differed from its European counterparts, having wings like an eagle, often portrayed as female, and depicted sitting on its haunches with a raised paw. In Greek legends, the Sphinx had wings and a serpent's tail, and it devoured anyone who couldn't solve its riddles. Interestingly, the original name given to the Great Sphinx by the ancient Egyptians remains a mystery because the term Sphinx originated from Greek mythology, which emerged about 2,000 years after the statue's alleged construction. It is also unclear how the Egyptians viewed the Great Sphinx during the Old Kingdom period, approximately 2613 to 2181 BC, as few texts mention the statue. Nevertheless, by the end of the Old Kingdom, the statue had become camouflaged in the desert and remained unnoticed for centuries. Inscriptions on a pink granite slab between the paws of the Great Sphinx tell the story of its salvation from the sands of time. According to this story, Prince Tutmos, the son of Amenhotep II, fell asleep near the Sphinx. 
In his dream, the statue called itself Harmachas and expressed sadness about its deteriorated condition. The statue made a deal with the prince. If he cleared away the sands and restored it, it would help him become pharaoh. When the prince became Pharaoh Tutmos IV, he fulfilled his part of the bargain by establishing a cult that worshipped the Sphinx. Statues, paintings, and reliefs depicting the Sphinx were created throughout the country, making it a symbol of royalty and the power of the sun. Despite Tutmos's efforts, the Sphinx couldn't be fully saved. Over time, it was forgotten, its body eroded, and its face damaged. The nose of the statue disappeared, with some stories suggesting that Napoleon's troops shot it off with a cannon in 1798. However, 18th century drawings indicate that the nose was already missing before that time. It is more likely that a Sufi Muslim deliberately destroyed the nose in the 15th century to protest idolatry. The Sphinx remained buried in the sand up to its shoulders until the early 1800s when Captain Giovanni Battista Caviglia and his team attempted but failed to unearth it. Eventually, French archaeologists, including Auguste Mariette and Emile Barres, made significant excavation efforts in the 19th and 20th centuries. It wasn't until the late 1930s that Egyptian archaeologist Salim Hassan successfully freed the Sphinx from its sandy tomb. Unfortunately, the Sphinx is currently deteriorating due to wind, humidity, and pollution. Restoration projects have been ongoing since the mid-1900s, but some attempts have resulted in additional damage. While it is certain that the Giza Sphinx is ancient, there is debate about its exact age. The most widely accepted theory is that it was built during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre, approximately between 2603 and 2578 BC, based on hieroglyphic texts. Khafre, whose father was Pharaoh Khufu, constructed the Great Pyramid, the oldest and largest of the three pyramids at Giza. Khafre decided to build his own pyramid next to his father's and surrounded it with a more elaborate complex that included the Great Sphinx and other statues. The Sphinx's face shows signs of red pigment, indicating it may have been painted. Some scholars believe that the Sphinx and Temple Complex had a celestial purpose, which was to bring back the soul of Pharaoh Khafre by harnessing the power of the sun and other gods. Supporters of this theory point to various pieces of evidence. Firstly, the Sphinx's head and face closely resemble a statue of Khafre found in the nearby Valley Temple. In the 1800s, remains of a road connecting the Valley Temple to a mortuary temple near the Khafre Pyramid were discovered. Additionally, a building called the Sphinx Temple was found, designed to connect directly in front of the Sphinx. In the 1980s, researchers claimed that the limestone blocks used in the wall of the Sphinx Temple were taken from the ditch surrounding the statue during its construction. It is estimated that carving the Sphinx from a single block of limestone would have taken three years with 100 workers. However, evidence suggests that the workers may have abruptly stopped their work, including partially quarried bedrock and remnants of their tools and lunch. Other theories regarding the origin of the Sphinx have been proposed, but have been largely rejected by mainstream Egyptologists. Some theories suggest that the Sphinx represents Khufu, or was built by Jedifer to honor his father. However, Professor Robert Schock, a geology expert, challenged the dating of the Sphinx in the early 1990s. His research pointed to a much earlier date for the monument, contradicting the prevailing view of Egyptologists. Schock's investigation began when he visited Egypt with John Anthony West and noticed inconsistencies between the geological evidence and the accepted dating of the Sphinx. He discovered that earlier, Egyptologists had suggested the Sphinx might be older than the pyramids. Schock believed that modern Egyptologists might not have all the correct answers, as respected Egyptologists from the late 19th and early 20th centuries had made different claims based on their observations of the Sphinx's appearance and atmosphere. A discovery was made 50 years ago by a little-known French scholar named R. A. Schwaller de Lubitsch. Schwaller studied the Luxor Temple in Egypt from 1937 to 1952. Through careful measurements and observations, he uncovered previously unknown geometric relationships in the temple's design, which were later confirmed by French archaeologists. Schwaller also found similar relationships in other locations. He published his findings in 1949 and provided more details in 1957. 
a reviewer for the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, encouraged his colleagues to take Schwaller's work seriously as it challenged the idea of Egypt's mathematical inferiority and added a new perspective to Egyptian religious beliefs. However, Schwaller's speculative interpretations of Egyptian architecture and inscriptions sparked controversy, causing other scholars to dismiss his findings. Schwaller also discovered a peculiar physical anomaly in the Giza pyramid complex. He noticed that the erosion of the Sphinx differed significantly from the erosion of other structures. Schwaller suggested that water, rather than wind-blown sand, caused the erosion of the Sphinx. However, his observations did not gain much attention or understanding until the 1970s when independent Egyptologist John Anthony West raised the issue. West compared the erosion patterns on the Sphinx, its temples, and the surrounding walls with those of other structures in the Giza Plateau. The rock of the Sphinx and its surroundings exhibited significant wear, giving it a sagging appearance with rounded edges and visible deep cracks. In contrast, other structures on the plateau showed only the sharper abrasions caused by wind and sand. Egypt experienced a prolonged period of heavy rainfall following the glacial shift towards the north from 10,000 to 5,000 BCE, leading to the transformation of the Sahara from a green savanna to a desert. This was followed by a shorter but more intense period of rainfall from around 4,000 to 3,000 BCE, which gradually decreased by the middle of the third millennium. West hypothesized that the unique weathering on the Sphinx complex resulted from flooding during the post-glacial transition, suggesting that the Sphinx was carved during or before this transition. However, Orthodox archaeologists firmly rejected West's theory. Nevertheless, West managed to persuade Schock to investigate the matter in 1990, and they both traveled to Giza in June of that year. Schock discovered extensive erosional features on the Sphinx's body and the wall of its enclosure, which formed a hollow after the Sphinx's body was carved from the bedrock. This led him to conclude that such erosion could only have been caused by rainfall and water runoff. Schock also noticed that the Sphinx is situated on the fringes of the Sahara Desert, and the region has been predominantly arid for the past 5,000 years. Moreover, there are several ancient structures from the Old Kingdom era that show signs of erosion caused by wind and sand, which is distinctively different from water erosion. Shaw concluded that the oldest parts of the Great Sphinx referred to as the core body must belong to an earlier period, possibly dating back to around 5000 BCE or even as far back as the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000 BCE. During that time, the climate was significantly different, characterized by more rainfall. Some people wonder if the erosion could be attributed to the rising floods of the Nile River. However, geologically speaking, the rock would display a different pattern if that were the case. The erosion is not caused by floods coming from below. Instead, it is the result of precipitation and runoff from rainwater above. Many individuals objected to the notion of the Great Sphinx being that old, because the head clearly resembles the head from the Egyptian dynastic period, which didn't begin until around 3000 BCE. However, upon closer examination of the current Great Sphinx, one may notice that the head appears too small for the body. Schock argues that this indicates that the current head is not the original one. Over time, the original head would have been deteriorated due to weathering and erosion. It was later replaced during the dynastic times, resulting in a smaller head size. Consequently, the head we see on the Great Sphinx today is not the original one. In fact, recent evidence suggests that the Sphinx might have originally depicted a lioness rather than a male lion. To further investigate the theory of an older Sphinx, Schock conducted seismic studies around the base of the statue to measure the depth of the weathering beneath the surface. His team utilized sound waves generated by striking a steel plate with a sledgehammer, which penetrated the rock, reflected, and returned to the surface. This technique provided information about the subsurface characteristics of the limestone bedrock. After analyzing the data, Schock discovered that the significant depth of weathering below the surface supported his conclusion that the core body of the Sphinx must have been constructed around 5000 BCE or earlier. During the seismic study, the team also uncovered evidence of a potential chamber or cavity beneath the Sphinx's left paw. Some individuals have suggested that this could be a hall of records. 
Additionally, minor cavities were found beneath and around the Sphinx, and the data indicates the possibility of a tunnel-like feature running along the length of its body. When Schock initially proposed that the Great Sphinx was much older than previously believed, Egyptologists challenged him by asking for evidence of an earlier civilization that could have constructed such a Sphinx. It was widely accepted that sophisticated civilizations did not exist prior to 3000 or 4000 BCE. However, there is no evidence of a highly developed culture dating back approximately 12,000 years, similar to the discovery of the Gobekli Tempe in Turkey. The disappearance and subsequent reappearance of these early signs of civilization in advanced cultures thousands of years later remains a significant mystery. Scientists have attempted to explain the unusual weathering of the Sphinx using various theories. One such scientist, Robert Temple, proposed that a moat caused water damage to the statue. However, another scientist named Schock presented six pieces of evidence that contradicted the theory. Firstly, the core block of the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple, which were refurbished with Aswan granite, showed significant weathering from precipitation during the Old Kingdom. This weathering beneath the granite cannot be accounted for by the moat theory. Secondly, surface erosion is much more severe on the western end of the Sphinx enclosure, gradually decreasing towards the eastern end. This pattern is attributed to ancient rainfall in the area's paleohydrology, which is inconsistent with the idea of a moat. Thirdly, rain had eroded the upper levels of the middle member strata on the western end of the Sphinx enclosure. If the moat theory was correct, the lower strata on the eastern end should have experienced more erosion due to the water brought in from canals connecting to the Nile. However, this is not the case. Fourthly, based on seismic data analysis, Schock suggests that the core body of the Sphinx dates back at least 7,000 years ago and possibly even 12,000 years ago. This challenges the moat theory, as standing water in the Sphinx enclosure would not have caused such deep weathering beneath the enclosure's floor. Fifthly, the vertical fissures observed in the walls of the Sphinx enclosure are indicative of precipitation and water runoff rather than being formed by artificial dredging of the enclosure, as proposed by Robert Temple. Sixthly, if the Sphinx had been situated in a pool of water, the water level around the Sphinx would have been the same as the surrounding water table. This would require the walls and floor of the pool to be watertight and able to withstand the pressure of the water. However, the current western end of the Sphinx enclosure sits on a higher elevation than the eastern end, and water erosion is visible on the higher elevations of the western end. This suggests that the water in a supposed moat would have required the eastern end and the walls along the northern and southern sides to be built up to a comparable height. Moreover, the bedrock in the enclosure has a cast morphology and would leak, making it unlikely that the enclosure was simply carved from the bedrock. There is no evidence to complete sealing with mortar and cement, which would be incompatible with the theory of vertical fissures caused by artificial dredging. Additionally, if the Sphinx had been in a pool of water, the chambers and tunnels beneath it would have flooded unless the enclosure was watertight. Schock and his team presented this evidence at a Geological Society of America meeting, where some geologists supported their findings while others expressed concerns. For example, one geologist questioned if the seismic refraction data aligned with the natural fluctuations in the rock layers. Another geologist proposed that the Sphinx, not just the head but the entire structure, was a natural rock formation known as a yardang, which could have eroded for thousands of years before being carved. One criticism of Schock's theory is that water damage at Giza does not necessarily require going back to the last ice age. Numerous instances of intense rainfall and severe flooding have been documented in the Nile region throughout history. The resulting damage and erosion were described by W.F. Hume, the director of the Geological Survey of Egypt, in his 1925 book, Geology of Egypt. Hume explained that desert rains lead to sudden floods, and the excess water carves new pathways through weaker layers of rock. Furthermore, Zahi Hawass, the director of antiquities at Giza, has observed the same erosion patterns mentioned by Schock, which continue to occur daily. Certain areas of the Sphinx's surface consistently shed large flakes, puzzling archaeologists and conservators who have yet to agree on the cause or remedy. However, they concur that the erosion is not caused by rain or the melting of Ice Age glaciers, as proposed by Schock. 
Possible mechanisms for erosion include wind weathering, water-saturated sand, and the crystallization of salt naturally present in the limestone after being dissolved by morning dew. Nevertheless, there are researchers, such as Graham Hancock, who support Schock's theory and even suggest pushing back the date even further. Hancock claims that the Sphinx symbolized Leo and was designed to face the rising sun in the constellation of Leo during the vernal equinox. Since the Sphinx precisely faces due east, Hancock argues that the sun would have risen in Leo between 10,970 and 8,830 BCE. Hancock also believes that the three main pyramids of Giza were constructed to represent the stars of Orion's belt during a period when the belt of Orion reached its lowest point in the sky. He dates the overall layout of the complex to around 10,450 BCE, which is more than 8,000 years earlier than conventional dating. Additionally, Hancock argues that the Valley Temple south of the Sphinx is the fourth dynasty. He suggests that the Valley Temple, with its square section columns, lack of inscriptions or reliefs, and construction techniques, must be significantly older and contemporaneous with his redated Sphinx. Hancock compares a structure behind the New Kingdom Temple at Abydos to Khafre's Valley Temple at Giza, noting architectural similarities. The Osirian Shrine of Osiris, similar to the Valley Temple, has squared section pillars without reliefs or hieroglyphic inscriptions, but it does contain inscriptions on walls and lentils naming Seti I, the first pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, known to have founded the main temple at Abydos. However, Hancock considers these inscriptions to be later additions. So this seems enough for this video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section.